Thomas from Noise and Instruments and this is our new module, the Quasar. The Quasar is the world's first binaural audio processor which enables three-dimensional sound in Eurorack format. This video covers all the features of the module and should give you some tips on how to best use it. Since Quasar is designed for headphones, you should also listen to this video with headphones as well as to all other sound examples out there. So let's do just a quick double check that these have the right orientation. And off we go! Quasar has two audio inputs, IN1 and IN2, two inputs for control voltages CV1 and CV2 and a stereo output OUT-L and OUT-R. There is also a dedicated headphone output on the right side. Note that the output of Quasar is always a left-right stereo signal. The input signals can be used either as two mono inputs or as stereo inputs. Above the tracks there are two small gain controls for the audio inputs and two larger volume knobs for the stereo output and the headphone output. On the top of the module are three more controls that determine the volume balance of the virtual 3D positions. The small encoder down here has clicks and is used to scroll through the menu. Press the encoder to enter the underlying menu where you can scroll through the available pages. The main controls of the module are two large aluminum encoders with LED rings. The display underneath shows what parameter the encoders are currently representing. The two encoders have no clicks so they turn smoothly. To go back just press the back button. Easy as that. The menu has a flat structure and is intuitive to use. We are currently in the main menu. In this state the LED rings act as volume indicators. I patched a small loop into audio input 1 and another loop to input 2. The right LED ring shows us the output level with the left side of the ring representing the left channel and the right side representing the right channel. The left LED ring shows us the volume of the inputs with the left side of the ring representing input 1 and the right side representing input 2. It is important for the sound quality that the sound is well leveled and the volume levels are mostly in the blue range. If the input level is too loud, there is another little red area up here that tells us we're close to clipping. With the input level, it's important to go into the module with enough level, no matter how loud we actually want to play the sound at the end. The output level should also end up being in the blue range if possible. Now we will generate a three-dimensional audio scene. Before we dive in, there is a little terminology to understand. To position a sound well in the virtual 3D environment, we not only specify the desired coordinates, but dynamic movement and room reverberation also play an important role. In this module, we refer to this combination as a quasar. In other words, the word quasar is used as an artificial umbrella term for precision, reverb and motion. There is quasar 1 and quasar 2. Now in this example, we are going to hear our loop from input 1 processed by Quasar 1. I am now going to the Quasar 1 menu, where on the first page we can set the vertical height and horizontal angle in degrees. Alternative terms would be elevation for the height and azimuth for the angle in the horizontal plane. In the current setting, the sound comes directly from the front. By turning the right encoder, I change the angle. Now the sound comes from the front left, all the way from the left, from the back left, all the way from the back, and from the back right. If I turn the left encoder, the sound comes from further up. Or from further down, 
and from further up again. I am just playing a little with the parameters so you can get a better impression. And I set it back to the front. When I press the menu encoder, I activate the auto rotation for the angle, so that the sound source permanently circles around the head. The units are revolutions per minute. If you hold down an encoder while rotating, the values can also be set in a finer grid, no matter in which menu. On the next page of the menu, you can now set the distance with the left encoder from only 20 cm away up to 10 meters away. A little bit of reverb can also help with distance perception. From very far away, I now move the sound closer and we are very close to the ear. And again a little further away. The reverb also offers two parameters on the next page, namely the room size and damping. The size essentially determines the length of the reverb tail and the damping sets whether the reverb sounds dull or bright. Usually, distance perception works a little better with a small amount of reverb, but locating height and angle works better without reverb. I'm now trying to find a good setting for this loop. I think it sounds good like this. The coordinate system of Quasar resembles a kind of donut, in which we can move the sounds. In the middle of the donut, there is the head of the listener. This is also called polar coordinates, where you define positions not by x, y, z, but by two angles plus the distance. If we go back to the height and angle page, in case of the right encoder, we are looking down at the head from the top. The top LEDs correspond to the position in front, and the lower LEDs correspond to the rear position. With the left encoder, we look at the head from behind, so that the upper LEDs mean the position is above our head, and the lower LEDs mean the position is below our head. On the other menu pages, we can now set an internal LFO that is mapped to the position coordinates. Here we have a variety of waveforms at our disposal. The speed of the LFO can be set in positive or negative direction. By pressing the encoder while turning, the speed can also be adjusted very precisely. The LFO speed ranges from 0 to plus minus 600 revolutions per minute, which corresponds to a maximum frequency of 10 Hz. On the next pages we can now specify how much the LFO affects which coordinate. I'll give here now some values on all three coordinates. A little bit on the height, something on the angle, and also a little bit on the distance. If we now go back to the first menu pages, we can see the influence of the LFO by the LEDs. The display still shows the manually set reference value. We can still change this value. When I activate the auto rotation again, the LFO is added to the auto rotation on top. That way, motion can be made a lot more complex. On the last page of the menu, there is another option for actions. These are used to reset the settings of the LFO or copy or mirror various options to the other quasar. This makes the creation of complex scenes much easier. For example, we can copy just the LFO or the LFO plus the position coordinates 
or LFO, position and reverb all together. Mirror means that the settings are copied, but the sign of the angle coordinate is reversed. A sound that is on the right side here in Quasar 1 will appear mirrored to the left side in Quasar 2. Auto rotation and LFO influence are also inverted. Height, distance and reverb, however, remain the same. This makes it easier to set up symmetrical scenarios. In this case, I want to mirror all parameters. By pressing the big encoder, I execute the action. Currently, we are still listening to Quasar 1 with our sound rotating clockwise around the head. Now I turn down the volume of Quasar 1 and go into Quasar 2. We hear and see that the sound rotates around the head in the opposite direction. Otherwise, Quasar 2 sounds the same as Quasar 1, since we copied all the parameters. I'll now play around a bit with the parameters of Quasar 1 and Quasar 2. Let's move on to the last remaining control, center position. If we turn Quasar 1 and 2 down and the center position up, we hear the original sound in its raw form without signal processing. In this case it corresponds to the dry signal, so to speak. In terms of a three-dimensional scene, this is as if the origin of the sound were in the center of the head. Using the volume knobs at the top, a mixture of dry center signal, Quasar 1 and Quasar 2 can now be set. It should be noted here that the position with only one Quasar may sound more spectacular than a mixture of all three. Therefore, there is an internal matrix mixer with high and low pass filters, so that we can build a flexible crossover. To do this, I now go to the menu of input 1. Currently we hear, again, only Quasar 1. With the left encoder I can now set a high pass or low pass filter. If I turn to the left we have a low pass. And if I turn to the right we have a high pass. By the way, as with many other settings in this module, there is a small dead zone in the zero range so it's easy to hit neutral again. Also, for example, if I set a crooked value via the fine control when I press the big encoder, like this, and then move back over the center position, I'm back in a straight value range. But back to the filter. It sits in the signal path between the input gain control and Quasar 1, which means I can use the filter to determine which frequencies actually enter Quasar 1. In this case I choose a light high pass filter. On the next page I can also set a filter for the path from input 1 to Quasar 2. Here I set a strong high pass filter. The third and last page corresponds to input 1 to the center position. I set here a strong low pass filter. If we now turn up Quasar 1 and the center position again, we hear that the bass stays nicely in the center while mids and highs move around our head. If I now add Quasar 2, where only the very high frequencies come through, we get a very complex three-dimensional image.
Now it's finally time to bring in the second input signal. Here we have this loop going on. Which we now also distribute to the quasars and the center position. What I want now is that input 1 only goes to quasar 1 and input 2 only goes to quasar 2. In the menus in 1 and in 2 we can also set the volume with which the signal is distributed to the three targets. But both inputs should also go to the center position. I also set the filters in a way that the base frequencies of both inputs hit the center while the mids and highs go to the quasars. Now let's hear how it sounds together. First input 1 to quasar 1, then input 2 to quasar 2 at a completely different position, and now the bases from both to the center. The fun in Eurorack starts with control voltages. Therefore, Quasar has two CV inputs that can be internally routed to all parameters. When going into the CV menu, we see that there are four pages here. On each page, we can route the control voltage to a different target 1 through 4. This means that a single CV can control up to four parameters of the module at the same time. I now go to page CV1 to target 1. With the left encoder I select a target. Here all possible parameters are available, which we have already seen in the previous part. Starting with the raw coordinates, we have here the auto rotation speed, the LFO speed, their amounts, but also all matrix mixer parameters like volume settings and filter are available here. I now select the angle of Quasar 1 for a simple demonstration and set an amount of plus 50%. As target 2 I set the distance of Quasar 1 with a positive amount and as third target the height of Quasar 1, this time with a negative amount. Now I patch a control voltage into the CV1 socket, which I can set externally between plus and minus 5 volts. We hear our loop through Quasar 1 in the initial position. If I now increase the control voltage, our sound moves from the front to the left. At the same time, the height decreases. If we look at the next page, we also see that the distance increases the higher I set the control voltage. As I move the control voltage to the negative range, the position moves to the right, the height increases more and more and the distance decreases. You see that with only one control voltage, we get a relatively complex curve along which our sound source moves. I also activate the auto rotation of the angle again. And we see that the control voltage is added also now to the auto rotation. Now let's select some different parameters as mapping targets. As target 1 of CV1, I select the trigger of the LFO in Quasar 1. With this setting, the CV input is interpreted as a gate input for pulses from 0 to 5 volts. At each rising edge, the LFO is triggered. I go into Quasar 1 and set up a sine wave LFO that slowly moves the angle.
I give a 0 to 5 volt trigger voltage into the CV. We see that with every trigger the LFO is reset. Some waveforms further to the right have the name suffix CV trigger single. These waveforms only go through a single cycle and can only be triggered by external CV. The random waveform is a very exciting one, where a new random value of the LFO is generated for each trigger. Also the spiral waveform is quite interesting. It outputs a swinging sign and lets the position wobble for a short time on a trigger. Exciting movements can also be constructed with single shot CV triggered waveforms like the ramp. With internal LFOs and external CVs, there are really a lot of possibilities to create three dimensional movement in your modular rack. Back in the main menu, there is one final item called More. Here we can, for example, save all our settings as presets, as well as load existing presets. There are already some presets available from the factory, whose function is also described in the manual. These are meant to be either a starting point for a new scene, or to show what the module is capable of. I now want to create a new preset and select an empty slot. I press the para encoder and can now enter the name. We can also use the large encoders in this view to move horizontally or vertically. Pressing the encoder selects the letter. When hitting the small arrow we can delete letters again. If we click OK we save. If you switch off your rack without saving as a preset, it doesn't matter, because Quasar remembers its last state. You can also choose from 5 3D transfer functions and check which one fits your hearing best. These have ear relevant names and are sorted by intensity. The human ear type is the most natural and is very close to the measured transfer functions with an artificial head. The further we go to the right, the more the transfer function acts as a filter on the signal and the more drastic the effect can be. The selection of the appropriate function depends strongly on one's own hearing as well as on the audio material used. For the examples in this video, the Hobbit type was used, which corresponds to level 2 of 5. If you work with the Quasar for a longer time, it can happen that your hearing gets a little tired. To quickly and easily compare the influence of Quasar with the unprocessed signal, there is a bypass function here. The moment I press the para encoder, 
You hear only the input signal without any processing. When you turn the para-encoder, you can choose whether the two inputs are distributed equally between the left and the right channels, or whether input 1 is output to the left channel and input 2 to the right channel, as would be the case with a stereo input signal. By pressing the back button, you get out of the menu again. The brightness of the LED rings can also be adjusted to the environment. The confirmation is always done by pressing the para encoder. As the last menu point, the zero position of the CV inputs can be recalibrated here. This is already done in the factory and actually only necessary if you want to change the internal SD card. Last but not least, I will show you really quick how to update the firmware of the Quasar. When starting the module, the current version is displayed. We need the included USB cable, a thin toothpick or something comparable, if possible not made of metal, and a computer. First visit the Noisehead Instruments website of the Quasar. At the bottom you will find the link to the firmware and the so-called Teensy Loader application for the Quasar's processor board. This is a small program with not even 5 MB. After the installation, the program window looks like this. Drag and drop the firmware file onto it and activate the little auto button on the top right. Now I turn off my rack and take out the Quasar. The USB connector is located down here. With the included USB cable, we connect the computer to the module. Now I turn the rack back on. With the toothpick, I'm going to press the hidden button that's down here. We see on the computer screen that the firmware is uploading. And that's about it.